Sounds like a good topic to bring into the, the, the conversation for sure. Hello, guys. Today we have a really special show for you tonight. We have EA Quetting, a Devil Incarnated, and we have Working Dragon Mystic, one of the best sorcerers concerning dragon magic and fey magic out there. And I would just like you guys to start talking and introduce ourselves and what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> Start, just start talking amongst ourselves. Well, it's good. Come on, I'm it's good talking, talking, that's more than that. To um, me, like, uh, I mean, like, I want to just say because we've never. Um, well, it's wonderful to have you back, EA. Uh, but we've never had Dragon Mystic on before. Um, so this is. Um, we're really excited to have both you guys. Really, really, really excited. And um, I've been, you know, following you um, straight for a while. And you just blow my mind. You're not just like an uh, encyclopedia. You're you're an entire fucking library. You know, you're just like what you know and what you can just like um, pull out of your hat. It, no, no pun intended. Is like really, really, <laughs> it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to give you a little bit of that introduction as you are a first time guest on the show. Thank you. I'm actually tickled to death to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, well, let oh. me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Drake, because I, you know, I jumped on and and I, I kind of researched you a little bit online before this conversation. You know, your your name had been thrown into some conversations uh, here and there over the past little bit, and I was like, who is this guy? I keep hearing about him. I keep hearing about him. But uh, one of the things I saw that you've done is um is some uh, what dragon dragon work uh, video courses. Um, yes, that's something that. Uh, First off, that's that's something that I saw there was a definite need for because honestly, most people just don't have the patience or the time to sit with a book and to, 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 to read a library of books to figure this out. But sitting down and talking to them through a video course really is a super helpful tool. How did you how, how have you found the success of that or, or the uh, the reception of it? I've actually found the reception of it to be um, amazing, honestly, really have. That has surprised me. Um, that was actually my wife's ideal. Nice. Um, we do move a lot, so moving everything online was really her ideal. I got to totally credit her for that. Um, and I, like I said, the reception's been great. The success of it's been great. Um, we've been getting emails of how well it's helped people reach that path of self-mastery and self-empowerment. Um, I do got people asking me for more material in book format, um, which I told them I'm going to try to do, but I'm more of a talker than a writer, so that's going to be a project in and of its own there. But... Um, you know, I've got a I've got a couple authors that I that I work with that just they literally cannot write. Like they 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 sit at the computer, they sit, you know, they, they just can't make it happen. And so I've worked with them and doing transcription, just have them speak into a microphone and then send that into a transcription service, have them transcribe that into a book format. Then you can go through and edit it and make it look, you know, make it read like a book. But there are a lot of ways because there I think there is a need for both both of those tools for the uh, the. So I used to think books were kind of archaic. I was wondering if books were going to go away, but I'm actually seeing that's a that's a pretty pretty permanent uh, standard of communication. Yeah, there's some people they honestly just connect better that way. Like my wife, um, you show her a YouTube video on something, she has to watch it 20 or 30 times. But you write it on a piece of paper, let her read through it, it's stuck in her head perfectly. Mm. So both mediums would actually be good. Um, and if you're okay later um, giving me your email address or something, I'd yeah. be willing to have that conversation with you. No, I'd love to. I'd love to. I'm not, no, like I said, I, everything that I saw about you, I'm loving your work. Uh, you know, it seems like um, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot. There's a ton of scammers in this industry. Um, and, and so when I look out and I see somebody who's obviously not a scammer, you do you do hold yourself up just as a – an ethical guy that's doing your part, you know, you don't build yourself up too much. You're just like, hey, I'm giving you what I've got. You know, I hope it's helpful to you. And, and I really love I'm a that. crazy redneck who practices magic. That's what I <laughs> keep telling people. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, cool. But uh, but no, awesome, awesome. Um, Can you work with Dragon Start? Can you tell something about that? Um, what are you Yeah, that is actually one of the weirder experiences I've had, honestly. So 
I was still living in Kentucky at the time and working at a UPS freight facility that was on an airport. So like it, you can't get in without IDs. And I came out of the break room one night and somebody stopped me and was like, you got dragons around you. And I actually kind of rolled my eyes and had to suppress a laugh. Um, and I was like, excuse me? And he goes, he starts talking. He's like, you should totally look up these books by DJ Conway and look into dragon magic. He's like, do you practice magic at all? I was like, I'm, well, at the time I was Wiccan because uh, I was still searching for a religious component to my practice. But um, I was like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I went back to my job because the guy said he worked on Mod C. Well, I had a buddy whose wife worked down there. Well, he was curious about this too because he'd never heard of him, couldn't remember, we went down there. We found out the guy don't work on that mod. Well, now we've triggered a security incident. And when we went to the security room, you can see the tape. There's me standing. There's me talking to nothing. There's people walking around nothing. And security asked, everyone he interviewed saw the person I was talking to, but the cameras did not. <laughs> now, I'm a skeptic. I am. I, I, anyone who's watched my channel, you know I'm scientifically minded. I am skeptical. But when I'm looking at a video, I know I'm talking to a guy. My attention has been gotten. And I looked up these books that I'd never heard of. No one I knew had heard of them. There they were. So... That is why I began originally studying it. And about halfway through her work is when the, the first four rulers are like, all right, we're changing gears. We're doing something else. I'm like, what? And then that was what would later become the path working that is now Dragon Magic 101. So it sounds like Dragon Magic was your entry into magic, period. It kind of was, because up until then, it was mostly just root work, herbalism, you know, candle magic, you know, the basics that you see in Wicca. Mm -hmm. um, but ironically, at this time, I was struggling with just religion in general, because like every religion I got into tended to be, and I apologize if we have any Wiccans watching, organized religion ended up hypocritical. And that just rubbed me wrong. Now I've said on my channel, I know a lot of people who do really well with religion. It just wasn't my cup of tea. So... It was, and the dragons were instrumental in guiding me when, because up until that point, magic had always been associated with some form of spiritualism or religion, right? Mm -hmm. So when you take that away from a newcomer, where do you go? <laughs> it's like being stuck in the ocean. You know, you got no compass, you got no land. Where do you go? And the dragons were very instrumental in helping me find that footing and that path. That's a really interesting, I'm just going to bust in and say that. that's a really interesting uh, observation that the dragons live in the watery depths. That's not where we live. That's, you know, that's where we can venture and play. But, but, but I like to think of that when I, when I think of that. Okay, so that's on one hand, when you look at the watery depths, when you look at that in, in any kind of mythology, it either means chaos and they can even use that, the ocean, to, to signify primordial chaos. Um, but it can also mean the, the energetic, the spiritual realm. And so these are, these are guides that, that actually can, if you get lost in the oceans, can actually and will pick you up and guide you safely to where you need to go. That's a really interesting point. And maybe, let me ask you this, maybe it's not until you're lost that they actually show up. Because I found that a lot with these forces, that it's not until I'm completely lost and, and, and bewildered that they, they, they show up and show themselves. Um, that does happen a lot. That really does. Um, like the lower elemental dragons, earth, air, fire, and water, um, those will tend to show up when you're not lost the most. Mm. Um, the ones that's usually referred to as the higher rulers, um, which is in dragon magic is referred to as dark, light, spirit, maelstrom, and chaos. Those will show up more when you are lost or... Mm. In some cases, when you need to be lost. Mm. Like, the chaos dragons, the reason they're so hard to work with, most people think of chaos like animaniacs, you know, yakko, wacko, and dot. They're just causing trouble left and right. Um, chaos to the dragons is about creation and destruction. For everything that's created, something must be destroyed. Um, which 
I would argue we see a lot of that in Loki. He's not just a troublemaker. Everything he does is about bringing change. Um, so you are correct. They're there and they tend to show up when you are lost, but they can also pop up when things are going right. Mm. Mm. Um, have you found, if I, if I can uh, jump in here, I found when it comes to things like the Fae and dragons and and whatnot, that I don't, it's not like I run into them out in the world. It's like they run into me or they've been with me the whole time and they're just making themselves, making me aware of them. It's not oh, like yeah. I go, I don't Absolutely. go out, you know, exploring and then just like bring us, you know, a, a fairy home with me or a dragon home with me. It's like, right. No, um, absolutely. Like, I work a lot with emergency services and the military and stuff. Some of the most fascinating interactions that I get and questions <laughs> come from firefighters and divers. So, like, I've got at least 10 firefighters that have had a similar encounter, and they don't know each other. They're from different states. But they will be in a house. It's on fire. It's burning. And for whatever reason, a wall a support beam, something falls, and they can see something literally push them out of the way. Mm. And they swear up and down that it is a dragon that's in the fire moving them out of the way. And this has happened multiple times with multiple firefighters. Mm -hmm. um, and since dragons are drawn to energies that relate to them, if you happen to be a dragon that likes fire, that's going to draw your attention. And they are very keen to protect us and watch over us. Um, even if we don't know they're there. And I have noticed the same thing with the Fae. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this um, is a story I like oh, sorry, I didn't mean never you. say uh, in public because this is kind of a story which is controversial to say. But the way I introduced to dragon magic was essentially I almost died. And let me kind of share a story. So I was completely uninterested in anything fae-related and dragon-related. I thought it's like a weekend bullshit, right? And <laughs> there is a local fairy queen in the area I am from, which is known as the mother of the forest. And so I call her once just to check her out. And what comes forth is like on the level of power of Lilith and Belial, like a really powerful being. And she doesn't say anything. She whispers some words in some crazy language I don't understand, and she just disappears. And then three, three months after that, I accidentally like meet with some traditional Serbian practitioner, sorcerer. And as stupid as I was, I tell a guy that I practice black magic. I kind of work with the jinn, I kind of work with demons. And he's like, okay, uh, I'm going to kill you because black magic is evil. And he put something on me. I didn't know what it was. It looked like a dark portal. And from that dark portal, you had infinite amount of tentacles. And I would call all of the demons I knew to remove that shit. Every other spirit I knew, every dark spirit I knew. And the only thing which happened is they would like cut a tentacle and then portal would open. And tentacle would come from the portal. And there is a really powerful ancient voice connected to that tentacle. And just like speaking from infinite distance. And I was like, this is not normal at all. What is going on here? And so I pull my friend, who is also from the same area as me, and I explained to her what is going on. And she was like, she called the great dragon to devour, to devour you alive. And I was like, what? So essentially what the guy did is he sacrificed me as a living sacrifice to the great dragon of the tradition. And so what I do is I essentially call the fae who serves under the dragon to remove the magic. And I just conclude the ritual and tentacles simply disappear. And then the dragon appears from the portal and tells me, I actually didn't come to kill you. I came to initiate you. And that's how I started working with them. So it was an extremely dramatic event. And what shocked me is that nothing worked on that spell. Like no angels, no demons, nothing. Whatever is that dragon, it transcends all of the systems. So like it's completely 
You cannot put it into a category. It's completely boundless. No, no you can't. Um, I have not encountered entities outside dragons that seem to be able to do this. Like, I've spoken with different pantheons and stuff, and they agree that dragons can do it, but they've also not been able to identify another entity that does it. But it's weird because, first off, dragons consume energy so if you throw energy at them they can eat it if they choose but they can also just choose to ignore it which that surprised me because my understanding is the energy and everything is what is reality so it's just like yeah we're going to ignore it <laughs> and i've not seen another oh, energy like that so when if a dragon doesn't want you to repel it you're not going to which is interesting, but at the same time, that's one of the things that, like, I've never met a group of entities either that dragons aren't friendly with and don't work with, because they keep that kind of multiversal balance happening, which, but, I mean, if you guys have found another entity, let me know, because I'm kind of curious, because that is a unique trait, and it's the trait that it appears that's exactly what was happening there. So a couple of weeks ago, Dimitri, I didn't even know that you encountered that creature. A couple of weeks ago, I encountered a creature named Hydra, which I didn't know what that was. I had to look that up. And Hydra is the monster in Greek mythology that has the heads that keep coming. And every time you cut off a head, it grows another head. Mm -hmm. I've had many creatures from um these sort of obscure monsters from greek mythology actually come so uh, i've seen i've seen uh these creatures in in really really far out soul travels where i'm basically looking out into the abyss uh i have seen creatures that look like uh like a giant uh, prehistoric whale type of creature with multiple heads but i see each head is going into a different dimension, and and, and now that's what's making me, what that's what that's what I'm thinking of when when uh, Drake when you, you when you're talking about the 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 dragons being able to ignore any kind of compelling command, any kind of energy that's thrown at them. It's not even that they have to deflect it; they can just simply act like it's not there. That does make yeah. me, that does make me think that they're what you know maybe traditionalists would call um a, they're, they're a casual. They they exist outside of the realms of causality that they don't uh, they're not bound by any of the laws here because they actually exist outside of this realm entirely right right i'd actually agree with you because um once you move up to the nine rulers eventually you get to um a concept that the dragons refer to as the dragon and dragoness essentially you have a male and female prime dragon if you will um they to actually directly approach them you have to do a ritual which is a ritual they have me working on now and i'll be honest this is the hardest ritual i've ever done um ea might be one of the few people who can understand what i'm talking about because the start of this ritual requires you to fully evoke all the other nine dragons mm -hmm. which then moves you up to essentially the gatekeeper kind of person um and you're going to have to evoke that one and then that opens the door that as far as I can tell, you are literally stepping outside what we understand as reality. Mm. Mm. Can Which I fits give to a, exactly what you just said. Same structure in the traditional Balkan tradition. So you have the four dragons of the elements, and then you have the two guardians of the keys, which is the Tartor, the demon of the water, and Chort, which is like the lord of hell. And then they hold the key to the realm inhabited by the old dragon and his concert. So, I mean, you can see the mythologies are mirroring what the dragons are showing me, too, mm. which I think is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Because so, I am not the first idiot the dragons have talked to. Let's be <laughs> honest. <laughs> well, well, now, there's, there's even a thought, you know, I noticed um, in, a, in a bunch of pictures online, Drake, that you, you're wearing a... Um, a Thor's hammer, and yeah, uh, there you go. All right, so so uh, so with that, the um, there is a there, there is a thought that that humans are um, descendants of the dragon, the, the, or at least uh, at least certain humans. Maybe not all humans, but maybe uh, maybe there's a uh, 
Um, I don't want to. I don't want to narrow it down. There's not like a, a race or a bloodline, but that there are uh, scattered humans that actually have the blood of the dragon that are walking amongst us. Maybe it's you and me. I don't know. That's an interesting thought. It really is. I mean, and I, I get asked this all the time, and what I think about it, and I really usually have to say uh, I don't know because on one hand, the dragons talk about if even the smallest portion of their energy was housed physically, it'd kill you. But then there's so many instances, like you're saying here, but the dragons don't deny those instances exist. They just keep saying this one thing over here. And if there's anything I've learned about them, there is a reason people say dragons talk in riddles. They don't talk in riddles all the time. But if they don't want to directly answer a question, they're not going to. Mm. So I'm still trying to figure out how the two things are true at the same time. People forget just because one thing's true doesn't mean the other one's not true. Two things can be true at the same time. You just got to figure out how. Mm. Um, and you could be right. Um, I know one theory that a magician put out is that dragons are very good at identifying people who, as he put it, are insane enough to understand the concepts they're uh, putting out to then translate it to other people. The, that, um, so that, that last part is the really hard part of it is uh, it's one thing to have the experience you get zapped by lightning but then to be able to like condense that to something that you can actually tell somebody how to how to take that experience and do something with and that's that I, seems to be my real gift um something about the way i grew up i can just like take a really complicated concept and dumb it down nice that seems to be the thing i'm what makes me the teacher i am yeah i'm um, straight can you tell me what relationship you might possibly see between the Fae and between dragons that you've encountered? Oh, yeah. The dragons and the Fae work together a lot. Um, in fact, my first encounters with the Fae was because of the dragons. Like, in fact, my first time meeting Mab was because one of the rulers was like, we're going to meet Mab. I'm like, no, we're not. Um, I didn't win that argument, by the way. <laughs> but... They do work together a lot in understanding and helping out in their different areas. Um, and they they have a big ally. And you have dragons that they they choose to spend their whole life within the Fey Wilds and the Fey Realms. These are what today have become known as Fey Dragons or Fairy Dragons, and they come in all shapes, forms, and sizes. Um, and their color patterns just as psychedelic as the Feywilds themselves, so they're absolutely gorgeous dragons. Um, but they, they're, like, they stay on that balance, that constant balance, and they don't really, they're not required to answer to any specific Fey queen um, or royalty, but at the same time, they never take a side either. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, if someone was does work in dragon magic, in my experience, only a matter of time before you bump into some fae. Um, and I think fae magic and dragon magic actually pair really well together. Because dragons can really help you navigate that whole fae law thing, which, that gets most people in trouble. <laughs> You know, so, so, so like you're saying, the, 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 the dragons seem to be, because they get along with the Fae, they just equally as well get along with goblins, with demons, with angels, yep. with just about any elementals for sure. They're, do, do they have any natural enemies? Any, uh, is there a nemesis of the dragon? Um, I think there is, because I've heard, like, they don't like to talk about it. And that's actually something what my ritual and my research is on, is actually trying to find out more about this thing. Conway even mentioned it like just like just a little bit in one of her books. Um, I can't remember if she called it the destroyer, the devourer, the destructor, something like this. It's like this shapeless mass that's moving through the multiverse. Um, and according to her, it's also uh, essentially trying to get dragons to turn away from the balance and become rogue. Um, those are some of the questions I'm now trying to answer after I've gone through the path workings they've laid out for me and trying to understand better because the dragons have shown me outside the perimeters of what we consider 
our reality. They and the other entities and pantheons, the different creator gods, um, even the fake queens, there's something they're keeping out. Uh. And they won't speak of it directly. Or at least they won't speak of it directly to just anyone. You kind of lit me on fire by the term rogue dragons. Like, just to think, like, there are these rogue dragons that are broken free from the order, and, and, and they're just doing whatever the hell they want. That sounds like a dangerous thing. And, and I'm wondering, do you have methods to, 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 that a person can contact and, and befriend such a rogue dragon? At this time, I do not. Um, by and large, dragons view rogue, rogue dragons as, like, the, most, the worst thing possible. <laughs> um, and they will actually send entire flights out to bring down one rogue dragon um, the ruler of chaos Zergaroth, one of his prime directives is to try and make sure the rogue dragons don't gain numbers because they they're not the moment they break away from the balance they do start to deteriorate mm. so they're not as dangerous as say a dragon who maintains that relationship in the balance luckily but still a dragon's a dragon and you get enough of them in one place with the knowledge they have that's a dangerous thing mm. so that's one of his main things and part of because again that he's the ruler of chaos which is destruction and creation so he takes problems like that does away with it while creating something that represents the balance again so, so you never uh, actually have like coalitions of rogue dragons that get together and like try to overthrow the the order of dragons or anything like that. Um, there's a few legends and stories like if you go to the Draconic Realm, there's this gorgeous like center hub um, where it's once you know how to access that city, um, it's the place in the realms where any race or species can go to visit. And there is a library that talks about different wars and battles where that has happened. Mm. Um, one story I read specifically in that library actually was talking about Odin and Zergaroth leading the charge, which mm. that was a pretty cool one. <laughs> mm. But outside those stories, and mm. they're definitely not recent, I've not heard of any. Well, so was, I wonder if that's what's behind the... The detest in the Viking mythologies, uh, um, in the Eddas, they talk a lot about uh, Nighthog, the, uh, the the dragon that sits at the bottom of the tree that eventually tears the tree down, and his name means Oathbreaker, and uh, and that's the worst thing that you can be, and so that traces me back to the dragon, like you're saying, those those uh, rogue dragons, they have actually broken yeah. the, their oath. That's a thought I've had, and I won't lie, that's something I'm researching, and I'm getting ready to attempt to do a Norse pathworking. So anytime I record a pathwork and actually make sure I'm in the path, I'm doing the path, I'm doing the workings, not just going through the motions. I don't like doing that. But one of the things I plan to do while I'm filming this and diving deep down into there, I'm actually wanting to look into Nidhogg because that specific dragon is so unique it just feels like a rogue dragon. You're absolutely right. And then, I mean, if you read the Eddas and the Prose Eddas and the Havamal, you know, people point to Jormungandr. Jormungandr, the dragons will claim him. They will absolutely claim him. Um, which took me some time to figure out because he wasn't born to a dragon. But um, they point out he is a creature of the balance. The Ragnarok isn't the end. It's a cycle of cleansing, destruction, and creation. And he plays such a pivotal role in that. Whereas Nidhogg just seems to be destroying. Mm. You know, and the, even the story of Nidhogg, that he, he ends up tearing, tearing the tree down because uh, the squirrel's coming up and down, chasing nuts up and down the tree. And that actually makes me yeah. think like, that maybe there's a, there's something to that story of like, don't get distracted from your actual higher purpose. Don't get distracted from your destiny and become like Nighthawk, breaking all your oaths because you're getting distracted by a stupid squirrel. I don't know. That's oh, just yeah. reading into it, you know. I would agree with you on that because I mean I talk about focus on my channel a lot. Just recently we did one on, you know, your focus determines your reality. 
if you sit around, you do nothing, you just play video games mindlessly, you're not going to achieve anything. And our focus will determine our reality. And what we focus, what we choose to use our time on, we all have the same 24 hour day. So what we choose actually determines that. And inevitably when I get emails about, you know, how do I improve my arcane senses? How do I improve in dragon magic? It's like, well, what's your schedule look like? Mm. Nine times out of 10, they're doing one ritual a week at best. Yeah, well, and, and, and you know, because I'll get that from a lot, a lot of consultations and, and like you say, emails that'll come in of, of things. And I'm like, well, <clears throat> let's start you out with um, just a five minute morning meditation, just five minutes of just just breathing. You're not supposed to be doing anything. You're not doing work. In fact, you're just taking five minutes out and just focusing on your breath. And yeah. uh, the resistance you get from people of doing that five minutes is, is and I'm like, that, that, that's just the beginning. That's the baby steps to get you up to the, the, I mean, multiple times a day of actually turning your attention to this, but you're not ready for that. So you can't start with five minutes and, 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 you know, you've got, we all waste a lot of time. Even the busy of us uh, waste a lot of time that you can spend on these things. Yeah. I actually just shot a video. I think it was yesterday. How to turn your morning routine that we all hate into a magical practice. Mm. Since you have to get up and you have to get ready for work anyway, make it part of your magical practice. Um, so. I would like to, if it's all right, you guys, um, I'd like to ask a couple more questions um, about the Fae. Um, like, EA, I haven't specifically asked you, what is your experience, personal experience with the Fae? Yeah, okay. So here's, <laughs> I, I don't have much... Uh, uh interaction with the fae i have had some here are the understandings i've come to um the fae you can't really summon them you can invite them to come and if they want to come they'll come <laughs> and that's one of the first things i, I learned because i started out trying to summon them and i ended up with um in iranian it's known as a pyrika it's basically a fae on fire that's there to kick your ass and uh, and set me on, set me straight and said, look, you don't you don't call us first off. If you do call us, you better either have nice things to offer or really good questions. If you have really good questions, they love to to, to they love to play with that and see how far they can get you to understand. And it's actually that's one of the things I got. From them. They're actually playing with our consciousness when they're talking to us. They're giving us these riddles. It's like they, it's like a little crank. They're trying to crank us as far into their world as, as as we can fucking stand. And at some point, it just starts sounding like gibberish. So that's those are the things I've learned about the Fae. <laughs> I, I totally that, agree. Like, I'm sorry, working on two path workings for summer and winter specifically. They're going to be two different path workings. We've got them so far developed that my daughter is actually testing the one for summer for me before we record it. And what you just described is exactly what these are showing. They're showing how you invite the Fae and how you speak to them, how you work with them, not how you just evoke them. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, there is something which I encountered during my practice, which is, I think, interesting. And this is something I have seen a lot of people who are traditional Fae practitioners in the Balkans say. I have no reason to distrust it because it came from multiple sources. But there seems to be an entity, because EA mentioned dragons, right? Rogue dragons, and you mentioned rogue dragons. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a Balkan tradition, because people work with that a lot, there is an entity associated with those adversarial rogue dragon currents. And everyone agrees that Iblis is essentially one of their leaders. Now, it doesn't make sense at the surface level because Iblis seems to be unconnected to dragons. But then you have another sources, Arabic sources, which claim that the supreme form of the genic nobility, like high-ranking genic spirits, really dark spirits, is actually draconian. Is that when you work with those darker jinn, like Azazel, for example, because Azazel and Iblis are just two aliases of the same spirit. Mm. Essentially, when you work with him on the deepest level, he is a, some form of a rogue, draconic being. And that's something he confirmed himself. 
he called himself an exiled serpent. But mm. I didn't associate him with dragons until people who work with them told me so. So this is not my own interpretation of something. And there is also one other thing which kind of bothers me is that essentially, like, if you look at fairies and dragons, at the surface level, those are separate beings, right? Separate races. But they seem to be a variation of the same thing. Like a fae is dragon energy on a level we can understand. Like the fae introduce you to the entire dragon magic. They are like initiators, while the dragons are like higher forms of power. Yeah, whereas I've, 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 had, I've had the same thought, whereas like goblins are the kind of the selfish, disgusting aspects or, or children. They're the disgusting children of the of the drag. It's almost like these are different, almost different races of children of the dragons. Is there anything to that? Um, I don't know, um, honestly, because dragons like. They have this really like hard line between what they refer to as a true dragon and not. Um, and they're like really against the concept of mixing entities, which mm. is an interesting concept. Now that would be in what we understand today. But if you, some of the older dragons will tell you that um, at least the dragon and dragon S predate many of the entities we know as creator entities. Mm -hmm. um, so just because today we have these hard lines, you know, this is a tr this is what dragons view as a true dragon. Um, wouldn't necessarily mean somewhere back further than humans can understand those lines didn't exist. And they may have took part in creating some of these other things, which if you create it, that is in a sense a, des a descendant of you in some way. Um, and it's interesting because people point out dragons aren't subjected to fey law. Well, they still have to follow fey law when they're in the fey realms, but fey have to follow it even outside the fey realms. Mm. But I would also argue, in point to what you just said, they may not be subjected to fey law, but dragons are still held to their draconic law. That law of the balance, otherwise you couldn't have a rogue dragon. Mm. So there's at least a similarity there that I think people really should look at. Um, Seems like with I the mean, dragons, there's a lot more harmony between the darkness and light. Yeah, there is. They honestly don't see um, darkness and light as being two separate things. They're just two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. You can't have one without the other. And that's yeah. one of the things I've loved about working with them, because with dragon magic being my main road, I can jump off here and learn anything, and the dragons are like, sure, let's go. Mm. And I've really enjoyed that. Have you ever have you ever had them pull back the reins and tell you, you know, don't touch this this particular practice or anything like that? I have. I have well, not practice. I've had them um, pull the reins and be like, don't do this yet. Mm. And me being me, like actually it's the ritual they currently have me working on. They gave that ritual to me several years ago and they were giving it to me in parts as part of the path work and as I was putting it together. And they were giving it to me in parts, but specifically said, don't do this yet. Mm. Um, because there's a very specific physical component to that ritual that I did not have. And most of my practice, I'll tell people in most cases, the physical stuff don't matter. Me being me and not entirely bright, went ahead and tried it anyway. And I spent 48 hours unconscious in my ritual room floor for it. Mm. And for the next month, I was, oh, I was sore. <laughs> it was not a pleasant experience. So they will tell you to hold. They will they will advise you to not do something. But at the same time, they respect your free will enough. If you want to blow yourself up, have at it. <laughs> this is something I, I want to bring up before I forget. But there's something that me and Dimitri have both encountered, which is a sort of celestial fay. Mm. Does this strike a chord with you at all, Drake. I don't want to um, go. Actually, I there are. Um, I can think of a few Fae uh -huh. um, that definitely would resonate within those celestial realms. They're still primary Fae. They're still held to the Fae laws. They still wander around the Fae realms. But yeah, they would definitely fit into that celestial concept. Yeah. And that's one thing people forget about the Fae. The Fae are not just like this one creature with this one energy and they all look the same. Yeah. They 
they're probably more diverse than the other categories because it's like every time I visit the Fay Realms, I see something new. I really do. And depending on the side of the Fay Realms you're on, summer, winter, you know, it it's so diverse and it's so crazy. So, and you do see so many Fay that work in. I'm going to guess every energy current out there. I can't say that I've been able to catalog that, but at least in the areas that I've been working through my career as a magician, I have found Faye everywhere I've gone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like, it's hard to walk that line, as you know, when you're talking about the Faye to not upset them or say too much, you know, <laughs> I always try to be really careful in how I. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. The but today I realized Mab took an interest in me, which to this day, I feel like I'm just like a chihuahua to her. Um, I spent the next year like looking over my shoulder like, did I done screw up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I know I get it. But yeah, yeah, I would definitely say Celestial Fay are a thing. Yeah. Well, then on the on the flip side, then would you would, would there be because I, I know the <laughs> one of the things I've seen, like I said, when 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 I was uh, not approaching the the Fey right, and I was trying to evoke them, I got what what I would consider a very infernal aspect of the Fey. I mean, not not a, a, a cute little Tinkerbell creature at all, but but oh, actually yeah. a, a pretty oh, hideous. Yeah. I mean, fangs and teeth yeah. and and all. Oh that. yeah. You're going to see a lot of that in both courts. Everybody thinks the summer courts like the happy go lucky. No, you're going to see scary, terrifying on both sides. Um, yeah. In fact. I would say the scary, terrifying ones are almost the ones that I trust more because with the Fey, the prettier, safer it looks, the more suspicious I get. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's that's the fey. saying something because those those darker Fey are fucking absolutely terrifying. So they are. And this day, with all I've seen working through the cliff off, working with dragons, there's still nothing that scares me as much as looking at Mad, looking her right in the eye. That to this day is the thing that scares me the most. Um, but yeah, you will see those and you will see the infernal, um, looking ones and just, to, I'm sorry, let me break in here real quick. Cause there is something that you said, you know, that at first your mind can only handle, uh, a, a glimpse of the hideousness of it. Uh, you know, yeah. when you're looking straight at, at Queen Mab or when you're looking at one of these creatures that's looking like they're about to devour you, your, 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 your imagination can only catch a glimpse before you start cutting it off. And there's actually a practice here that I'm sure you know you you are involved in of seeing how long you can keep pushing yourself in there and keep that keep that locked in there without without running away. And there is something yeah. that it feels like there's something that's transmitted to you while you're doing that. Oh, I would definitely agree. In fact, um, I've made the statement to a few of my students and colleagues that I don't think we truly have seen the entities we say we've seen entirely. We have seen what our brain is capable of processing at that time. And this is why every person may see an entity in a slightly different variation. Not only is the entity A, it doesn't have a physical form locked in, but it's also showing us what we can relate to and what our brain can handle. And yes, like you said, that whole looking at an entity, constantly spending time with it, trying to understand it deeper to see more of it. Yes, I've done that. Um, I do that with the rulers. I've tried a time or two with Mab. It always ends in nightmares. <laughs> um, but I would absolutely agree with that practice. Yeah. I find that the, the ones that I run into um, sort of accidentally out in nature, um, are really scary because I'm kind of in their territory and um, it's always really sketchy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get you. Cause but I'm that weirdo. Like I've been in Louisiana hunting Rougarous. I've gone to different sightings for hellhounds and skinwalkers to try and do investigations. Uh -huh. um, so I am that idiot that goes in the woods looking for things that can hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> Not the brightest. Um, if I may, though, can I ask you all an interesting question that um, a few of my colleagues have been asking me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you all think there is a need for modern magicians to come up with an agreed-upon lexicon of terms? 
because right now we have one term meaning 30 different things and you have to figure out where you're coming from before you can have a clear conversation. You know, here's, so yeah, here's I definitely agree with that 100% because, you know, forever I have trying to explain people that like essentially uh, different spirits are essentially the same type of spirit. We are just calling it different words because we are kind of dumb. So majority of demons, which people consider demons, so there are actual demons which are non-terrestrial dark spirits, which are transcendental. But majority of the time when people talk about demons, they actually talk about dark fae slash dark elementals, like spirits who are just in nature out there and they are malevolent and destructive. And uh, I, that's something I have been having a really hard time teaching people. Also, some of the so-called Goetic demons are when you investigate them and the lore of the land they are coming from, Arabia, Middle East, those are actually dark fae, dark fire spirits. <laughs> like yeah. Those are not yeah. unbound from Earth at all. Some of the quote-unquote Gothic things. And so that's like a really hard nut to crack for a lot of Western occultists. Because when you oh, tell yeah. them the word demon, they just mean fallen angel. And so when you figure out that what we're talking about and working with has nothing to do with the angels altogether, then they are having an issue. Mm -hmm. And you cannot explain them anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the example I always give is pick up any dictionary on demons, and I'd say 50% or more, they're just deities someone else disagreed with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's all there. As far as a, 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 a universal magical lexicon, I think that I think that's needed. You know, one of the, the, the really interesting point that we're at is um, we've had it, we've had a, an explosion of freedom, along with an explosion of technology that's allowed us to all communicate about this forbidden topic. And and uh, you know, we were never able to even have these conversations without being crucified, and not just in the the, the um, medieval witch witch burnings. But in a lot of different cultures through time, uh, the discussion of this was forbidden except in the priestly circles. And so, um, so now that where the layman is able to get their hands on this, start experimenting with it, we're able to, to, to see what it does in our lives and report on the, uh, the thing, we, we're, we're actually kind of creating the lexicon right now as we go because we're all discovering this right now together. Um, yeah. I, I, th I, think, I think that kind of lexicon, I, I've actually thought about this and, and I think it would need to be an online kind of a wiki type of thing that can be edited as we go as things update. Yeah. That's something that um, myself and a few others have been pondering on because since starting working Dragon Mystic and having a chance to talk to so many people, um, both experienced in magic and just coming to it, I noticed one of the biggest roadblocks is just sorting through the terminology. Oh, it's a whole thing. People, whenever anybody that's new to this path gets their hands on any of my books, they, they, they write me and they're like, dude, I need a dictionary, but not an English one. What kind of dictionary do I need? And I'm like, well, yeah, because it hasn't been created yet. Because there is there. Right. And there are even a lot of terms that you actually cannot find in the dictionary because they're unique to the occult. They really are. Um, so that, that was just something I figured since I got you three here, it'd be an interesting ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do it. You got my thumbs up. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Create that shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, no I, think, I think that is needed. Well, and, and so this is one of the things I put out a challenge uh, back in 2018, I think. Um, I had a lot of people talking a lot of smack online about me, and so I just put out an open challenge. Hey, anybody want to debate me? I'm, I'm free for, for uh, full-on debate. I only had a couple people take me on that, and those, those always turned out to be really good conversations where we realized we actually agree on almost everything, but we've just been using the wrong terms or understanding the wrong terms. Once we can right. flesh it out, like, what do you actually mean by this? We're like, oh, we actually agree with each other. That That's a... You nailed it. That is a big problem I see in the community as well. Yeah. We yeah, have a lot more in common than not. <laughs> and and, the, and one, one of the issues with that is uh, people get into 
these pet understanding of different terms. You know, like let's take uh, let's take um, oh man the uh, uh, archons. You know, you ask anybody what an archon is. That's even more divisive right now than asking about what a demon is. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, people figure out the Hecate was classified as an archon in many of the Gnostic texts. They shit in their pants because, like, then their entire archon terminology falls apart, you know? So it's like, I don't know. And it's really interesting. So this is what I kind of got from Solomon AD, and you are definitely familiar with that. When you work with Samael a lot, you'll figure out that Samael. And the demiurge from the Gnostic texts, Yaldabaoth, are the same being. And mm. Samael refers to himself as Yaldabaoth. And Yaldabaoth refers to himself as Samael. And mm. so where, what the fuck should we do with this information? I mean, technically, a lot of people don't know this. Like, what the fuck should you do? And this kind of makes a question. So if Samael is Yaldabaoth, and if, and if Yaldabaoth created the angels according to the Old Testament, then all angels are aspects of Samael, and Samael is present within all angels. And yeah, well, we cannot work with and, angels. And then to, to, to take what you're doing and, and flip that on the other side of the tree, Samael is also associated heavily with Satan and with the uh, the, the Lord of the entire uh, dark, dark legions. And so what the, yeah, what the, what the, yeah, what the secret, what the secret here is, is that they're full. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and honestly. Um, that's one of the reasons, like, the channel um, that I do and how I approach it is focus on your path, but more specifically, your results. Mm. Because if we we can debate terms till we're blue in the face, we can debate personal gnosis till we're blue in the face. But at the end of the day, if you have a group of magicians who sit down and instead of debating terms, we discuss actual results therein lies the kicker because these entities could be using different names and even presenting the information differently based on the person they could be basing it on the culture the person grew up in um, so many different things that they could base how they present it but if the magician looks at their path, looks at their goals, looks at what they're trying to achieve, whether it be self-mastery, ascent, doesn't matter, take your pick, and you're recording your processes, you're recording your work, and you're getting the results you're looking for, and your path is fulfilling to you, whatever that would mean, because let's be honest, fulfilling means different things to different people. Then it just suddenly, at the end of the day, that's really the goal. That's really where we get to where we get to. And I think at the end of that road, just like there's many paths up a mountain, once we get to that peak, we realize all those variations of ideals still brought humanity to the same point, which theoretically would be to better us. That's That's my two cents on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so there is, you just you just kind of hit on something that I think is uh, a really interesting cornerstone and part of the mystery that we're all trying to unravel is uh, whether we're talking about fey or, uh, or demons or angels or any of these beings, it seems like they're all highly invested in our evolution. They're, they're all trying to give us something to help us evolve. And that's a really crazy thing because, you know, uh, most of the time, I just feel like I'm a, I'm a monkey that developed a little bit of a, a smart enough uh, uh, ability to drive a car and make magic work. I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, why are we, why are we so special that, that these creatures, uh, not only that they pay attention to us, because that's, that's actually a question a lot of people ask. Why would they even listen to us? Why would they even pay attention to us? But it, it's even further than that. They're highly invested in us. So it's like, what are we? That is an interesting question. I've heard different magicians with different theories. Um, and I mean, when you say you feel like a monkey, believe me, I understand that because Danny here can tell you how much trouble I just had getting Scott to work. Um, <laughs> but I've just heard magicians actually say that one of the reasons humans are so predisposed and skilled at violence and war is because we are being 
um, we are kind of an experiment of warriors to be, but we, they don't just want killing machines. They want warriors that are true philosophers, understanding of that concept of balance. You know, when you need to fight and when peace is, you know, what you fought for, you enjoy the peace when you have it. Could be. I got to give credit. That makes the sense, most sense when you look at human history. But there's also the concept where people think that we are being taught to be better as um, a race or a people and understanding um, to essentially raise above what we view as our flaws. And either one of them could be true. But what I have, what I'm dead certain on is these entities are invested in us. They want us to hit that ascent point for some reason. And it could honestly be a little bit of both because we do <laughs> see certain humans, they're far more compassionate. They're, um, these are people who definitely make far better healers than they would, you know, soldiers mm. um, and scholars. So I personally, I'm, I'm not going to go all in on one concept or the other. I just think, as a whole, the human race has a lot to offer. The multiverse knows it, and perhaps this is how they raise those entities. You know, we they start them in the physical. This is kind of the training ground or the playpen. And once you graduate, that is what we refer to as ascent. Mm. Um, to, to, to jump back a little bit to what Danny was saying about uh, going wandering across the Fey that are just out in the wild. Um, you know, for, for me, I know I like to, do, if, if I can, and it, it's almost an immediate sense, I can immediately sense the, the, the presence. And I'll just kind of tune into it and, 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 and ask permission, first off, can I, can I walk a little further? And I'll usually get instructions like, don't step on the flowers or, you know, things like that, that I can do as I, as I go forward. Sometimes they'll ask for offerings. Sometimes it's stuff that I don't have. You know, one, one time I, I, I just felt really strongly I needed to leave some honey uh, and, and just like a pile of honey on the ground. I was like, uh, I don't have any honey with me. Sorry. Um, so we'll go get some honey. Yeah. I'm not coming in without honey. Um, but uh, what are some things that people can do when, you know, if they're actually like some suggestions you have, for being safe and then like for, for having a good experience out in the wild with uh, Faye. Okay, so I can give you some tips, but first off, let's remember, I grew up in the Appalachian. There's no part of that mountain range that's safe. Yeah. <laughs> um, even people who say they don't believe in ghosts, they believe in ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, well, let yeah, me, I'm sorry, let me, let me pause you there is uh, that's, that's one thing to know going forward. There is really no safe path. There isn't. Safety okay. is an illusion. Yeah. Safety is an illusion. You're absolutely correct. The question is what level of risk are you willing to tolerate? Mm. Um, but when you're out there, when that happens, um, you can easily ask them, you can state like you, your honey example. You can be like, I'm currently not carrying any honey is there something I could do, a prayer you could say, um, an energy type I could conjure up for you, or um, perhaps pick up any trash I find along the path to help you take care of your land? Because one of the weird misconceptions I found about most people have about Faye is they're like these nature spirits 100%. They take care of their area, but it doesn't have to be nature. Like you will find Faye in New York City. They love the city. They are just intrigued by it. Um, so it's more about the, the taking care of your property. You know, the difference between just letting it overgrow and go to crap and actually taking care of it. Um, and if you're willing to assist them in that, as long as they okay it, you got to listen for that okay. Because if you offer to pick up trash and they're like, no, I want my honey. Okay, if they want the honey, you got to get the honey. But there are things you can do and offer that um, you can negotiate with them. But and maybe even ask them, can I set the honey outside for you when I get home? Is would that be an option? Now that's this is a double-edged sword. Be careful. Because like just a few months ago, I shot through Utah on a road trip. We'd done some stopping. There were some fake. I could have one of them specifically is like, no, you don't come here. You don't have what you personally need. I didn't have time to debate them. 
I'm not going to at that same time ask if I can offer it when I get home because that gives that fay permission to come to my place now. Mm. So you got to make sure you're okay because it can't collect what you're offering unless you you know you allow it to your place. Mm. So you got to be careful with that one. Um, but that is one of the things where. Anytime you're wanting to work with these entities, you need to make sure your senses are developed so that you, whether it's emotionally or audibly, you can hear and understand what's being said. Because you don't want to assume they just took your offer. Yeah, I think so. One thing that can be helpful is sort of um, establishing a relationship with the Fae that that you probably have that kind of walk with you and that are familiar with you already, whether you know it or not, kind of fae that are in your sort of lineage. Um, and I mean, just, you can do that just kind of like basically um, calling your guides, your guardians and the elements over time and, and getting familiar with the fae that are familiar with you already that way. Um, and that is, sort of gonna help protect you in those situations when you're out and about. Um, what I encounter when I'm in those places and I encounter element, you know, dark elementals, fey, whatever, is like, they wanna play. <laughs> They're not asking me for offerings, they just wanna play. Um, and that's, I know that that's, I'm, uh, uh, the way that they wanna play is probably not something that I'm capable of handling <laughs> most of the time. Uh um, and I will admit that's a perk where I've found in dragon magic because since uh -huh. your guard dragon is always with you and they're young dragons, they're very playful. Uh, yeah. They tend to have the energy to play with these entities and distract them from you. Uh -huh. and then, yeah. and that co-magician being an older dragon yeah. is constantly there too and can also be that voice of negotiation. And of course, when you know when I say play, I don't really mean play the way we think of it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I mean, how do you mean? I've, mean, seen, like, I've, I've seen a guardian dragon literally chase a fae around like a, two dogs chasing each other. Um, I'm not sure the fae was necessarily as, as inclined to play that way as the dragon, but I've also I, seen, yeah, I've seen the fae get rough and these little dragons. I mean, we equate power and size so well. But a little mushu looking dragon, they ain't afraid of it. <laughs> They're just like, let's do yeah, it. But when I like say there play, is something, sorry, go ahead. There is something interesting I wanted to like ask uh, ask working dragon mystic because like there is a phenomena which uh, I encountered like seventeen times by now. <laughs> so when you are going into a new area and you want to meet the fate of the place. I was told the specific procedure. So when the sun is going to set, so in a sunset, you go in a wooded area, like a grove, you raise a sacred space, like a protective circle, and then you cool the fate of the land in that protected circle with a lot of energy raised so no tricksters can appear, right? And so right. the fate will start coming to you. And they will introduce themselves. I am so and so, Faye. I am doing so and so. And all of them will want like to work with you. All of them will want something. But you are supposed to insist to me it's king of the land, right? The king of those local Faye. And so mm -hmm. those Faye will go, another will appear. And every other group of the Faye will try to convince you that they are actually the boss. Mm -hmm. Until when the real king appears, they will all just bow down like bend the knee in a way and you speak to that king if you want really to work with the mysteries of the current like there is that phenomena of them trying to prevent you from meeting the king at all costs almost as if king is hidden he is not appearing yeah. or he is not supposed to appear and it's something i really experienced only with the fate that they tend to guard their royals in a way they tend to hide their royals from the world. And this is a concept I want to ask you, like, is that any truth to this in your experience? Um, I've seen that in traditions that work with the Fae, um, definitely uh, European Germanic style traditions. Um, the Fae themselves, 
I don't know if they're trying to hide, but they will, like any of the nobility within the Fae, they will send smaller Fae first. Yeah. Because it's kind of like, how serious is this magician? Will they take the first Fae that's going to listen to him or the second Fae, you know? Um, it's almost like this procession precedes them, and if they don't actually have to deal with you, they're not going to. Um, so there is a semblance of that. And that, that, again, that's one of those things we have to wonder how cultures have translated it. Um, well, there's, there's a similar thing in, uh, in tantric, uh, tantric history of, of a, a specific... Um, a specific mystic that uh, that went into the Bodhi forest looking for the Dakini queen. Dakinis are very much like uh, Fey. They're they're feminine embodiments of of all power, and uh, and and he needs he, he's got to continue this uh, this mantra. Otherwise, he'll get seduced by the various Fey that are or the various uh, Dakini that are on the on the path, and uh, and the, and the whole thing is he's got to keep his focus. Only on the queen. He, you know, he's, he can't settle for any of the other any of the other entities, and they will present themselves as the queen. But, um, but specifically, the, the the whole idea is through non attachment, through interacting with them without without getting carried away by the sexy things they show you or the violent things they show you, without getting moved by it. That uh, that you can actually see through their illusion. So, so that's 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 you know. There is an interesting thing, like we've been saying throughout this conversation, a lot of links into different cultures where these same stories are being told. And it comes back to maintaining your focus on your goal, too. Mm. So, mm. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty fascinating phenomenon that does happen there. Um, yeah. Um, and I just want to say, when I, so when I say play, I mean that that can be very predatory. I don't mm. know. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know. Um, I know. And I did get that, and the like I said, yeah. the dragons, they will keep that form of play away, because I know we got to be careful with the YouTube and all that. <laughs> but um, uh, also, so you from Appalachia, correct? Yeah, I grew up in the um, eastern Kentucky and Tennessee areas. Yeah, so those earth elemental type spirits are very, very, very powerful, and uh, I've seen some crazy stuff in the hills and the mountains around here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, once we do finally retire, me and my wife, we're both in agreement. We're heading back to the Appalachians. We just love the area. Mm -hmm. But working with the elementals and the spirits in those areas um, and the land whites is just, I can't explain it. it it's a completely different feel to any other things um, I've worked with. Yeah, yeah. Because right now we're toward the West Coast, but... And don't get me wrong, I love the entities here. Where we're at now, we used to be. So um, coming back here was like coming back to old friends, the way the spirits and um, entities welcomed us back. Uh, but yeah, the Appalachians are interesting because I remember growing up, you hear so many different things. Like if you hear a whistle, you didn't. If you hear somebody call your name, you didn't. And you're just like, what are you talking about? Um, and they won't tell you what they're talking about. <laughs> They said you'd uh, you said you'd done some uh, some skinwalker hunting. Now, I'm I'm down in the uh, southwest United States, and uh, we've got the, the the Paiutes are the the tribe that's around here mo mostly, and uh, there are there are absolutely skinwalkers, and it's it, you, you absolutely cannot get anybody from the res to talk about them. Um, I know where you, I know a spot. I know yeah. a spot. Go. So so, so so what have you what have, what have you guys found? Um, I'll be Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> um, Go ahead. Me and my team, we've gone to different areas. We've talked to different Native American shamans who would talk to us, which is hard to do. Um, and every time we've searched, we've found weird phenomenon happening. We've found equipment malfunctions, um, sounds that we can't account for. Um, at one point, some one of our guys, his tent got completely wrecked, and we had a tracker there. He couldn't identify what wrecked it. But beyond those, like anything, like did we spot anything where I could say I saw a skinwalker? No, it's just always the um, almost satellite phenomenon that people would say surround their presence. Mm. That's the only thing we've been able to catch so far. 
Mm. Yeah, that that sounds like that's uh, that lives up to the mythology of them because yeah. yeah. But now my interest it, in hellhounds comes because I'm I'm pretty certain I saw one at my dad's house one time. Mm. Um, I'll never forget that dog and like it tried to cross a flat, um, and it got. We was able to see the tracks up to twenty feet before the woods, which is where it appeared like it just vanished. And if you ask my brother, if you would have asked my dad before he passed, they're like, oh, no, the dog just jumped in the woods. It didn't jump, and that's a 20-foot jump. Mm. That's a big jump. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no landing in the woods, you know? There's no impact. So ever since that day, I've been fascinated with them. Mm. And the myths around them. We actually did a roundtable where... Me, Jade, and uh, Halloween, my daughter, um, we discussed hellhounds and some of their myths. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So, like, I don't... So there is a concept I would like to ask you, working Greg, Greg about. So with Faye I worked with, there is a concept of a boundary, like mm -hmm. a magical boundary they have. And that boundary is actually a form of energetic vortex, which they feed in order to protect their worlds. And there is a really controversial deal, which some of the Fae ask you to make, which is you are obligated to protect the boundary for them with magical rituals. And that sometimes involve aggressive attack on all of the living creatures who want to destroy the boundary regardless of the type of creature we are talking about. And you are also obligated to provide the energy for the vortex. And I wanted to ask you, is this something you found in other practitioners or in other traditions? Uh, because um, this is something I was commanded to do by them, basically. Right. right. I've not personally encountered um, something like that to that level. So the most I've encountered is like, um, well, here where I'm at right now, I've um, worked with the Fae and the spirits around here. And part of the agreement is, you know, they will help me and my family and the stuff we do. But I am also to help them with their territory, their lands, their properties, those kinds of things. And what they would view as their boundaries. Um Sometimes that's just like magically reinforcing their boundaries. Sometimes they will give me a specific thing they want me to do. Um, but as far as like, you know, violence toward another, that's never been asked. That's never been asked. Um, which uh, I was actually one thing, Oh, sorry. Sorry, cut you off. Which is also one of the things, you know, like I make it very clear where I stand on what I will and will not do because, like, I'm a very honorable person. I have a very, you know, it's not hard to figure out how I'm going to react if you know me. So I will make it very clear, you know, I'll help them, but I will not violate my ethics or my honor in any way in the process. If that's an issue for them, let me know now. So I put the ball back in their court. That's the beauty of Fey Law. It does work both ways. <laughs> yeah. And where, where, where Dimitri was talking earlier about uh, uh, going to a place where the Fey are at and then, and then uh, um, casting a protective circle, that immediately made me wonder, do they, would, they, do, do, would they be affected by a, mag a protective circle? Can they, can they not penetrate that? I know so, yes and no. <laughs> okay. So can they so penetrate? Yes. Would they? No. Mm. Because it kind of falls under, with Fey Law, it's almost like a hospitality rule. Like, when you set your space in that circle, this is your space. This is your space. And they will respect your space as long as you're respecting their space. Mm. Um, so, essentially, the rationale, so I was, as I asked the exact same question. So, there are different degrees of power among them, right? There are those who can cause earthquake in a second, and then you can say who can barely like make cattle work properly, right? So the goal of the sacred space is to keep low players out, right? So you keep really weak fey out by setting yep. a space which only stronger fey can cross. So you root out 
you essentially save your time this way in order to meet the stronger among them faster. That's the entire point. Of course, if any of the fake queens wants to do something to you, you are dead. Like there is no discussion. You're gonna disappear before you are aware what is going on. <laughs> Pretty much. So I mean, which I would argue that protective circles almost don't work in 90% of cases. Like astral nasties, um, human spirits, those things they can keep out. But most of the entities that people think of as strong or powerful entities, that circles less than wet tissue. <laughs> in my experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. EA, I, I just wanted to ask you, you've mentioned you're, um, have, you've had these encounters with goblins. Is this what happened when you were over in Europe? Yeah, well, yeah, while well, I was in Iceland. Um, oh, well, okay. I, I actually started, so I actually started catching visions of goblins. I was, when I was going through my voodoo initiations, um, I wasn't aware that the guy who was initiating me was uh, not a hungan or a priest, but he was a bokor or a, a, a black magician. And uh, so he was guiding me through the, the, the dark path. And uh, the final initiation, uh, he got me in contact with an entity named uh, Prince Zandor. That's basically a goblin. It's a, 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 a the, the story is, is that he's a person who invested himself so much in evil that uh, um, he lost one of his limbs. Some of the stories, it's a leg. Some of the stories, it's an arm. He, he gave up an eye and uh, and his body is just kind of withered away and mutated because of his devotion to evil. And uh, and so I started seeing this the, the, with the ritual, you you you. Um, you get a mirror and you've got to break it and then set it at a particular angle and then do the ritual looking straight forward so you're catching in your peripheral vision what's going on in the mirror and that's where you start to see this very goblin creature and and so this was back in i think it was like 2010 that i started doing this and uh and so the goblins have kind of been peeking out but then when i went to iceland it was just off the charts because iceland is iceland's a unique place where there's a there is a crossover. The veil's not very uh, thick, thick there. So, um, so yeah, I definitely got into contact with just like, I mean, just tons and tons of goblins. It's a lot like the Fae. Like you know, when you open the door and they become aware that you're there and you're aware of them, they just gather around you. And and they are they are very Fae like. Where it is, it they, they, it does seem like they're almost the opposite of Fae. They're 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 what Fae could become if they were completely cast into darkness. And and what so what was their what was their mo what was their what were they into what was their agenda do you find um, so they had really no agenda with me at all they didn't care if I learned anything from them they didn't care if I did the, I was more or less a trespasser in their area and I started okay. observing them quietly observing everything that's going on and and so so with goblins I would say their agenda. 100% is always selfish, 100% selfish, whatever serves them best in that moment. And then one of the one of the things that really struck me about goblins is that they um, they hover around vapors and vapors are created by anything that's passionate, anything that's violent, any kind of uh, any kind of circumstance that involves a collision of a lot of different forces creates a certain kind of vapor that they hover over and feed off of. Um, and actually, if you, if you leave them an offering, they don't eat it, they don't touch it, they, they stand over it and, and absorb the vapors of it. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting thing. All, all of this, everything that I learned from the goblins, which I'm, I'm putting in a necromancy book that I'm uh, throwing out uh, next month, actually, with Edric Carval, um, called Conjure Necromantic Sorcery. And, uh, and I've got a whole chapter there about everything the goblins taught me, but they actually didn't speak to me once. They didn't. They barely even acknowledged that I existed, other than to tell me to keep away from certain things. But but just by observing them, you can learn a lot. And I think this is very similar to the Fae, very similar to dragons. It's getting into direct conversation is difficult. So instead, just sit and watch for a while. And did yeah. you find that they took on uh, certain types of forms? So yeah, so. The, for, the forms that I would say I, I would see them in is transferring between vapor, that they would become vapor themselves, or, or that, that if they took on a form, it was very much like uh, 
um, like what's his name from uh, the Hobbit, the, the the little guy that's always after the rain. Um, Gollum. Gollum. Yeah, 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 Gollum. So, 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 one hundred percent. It looks like just different variations of of that of that creature. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and and a very similar, you know. So this is a, a funny thing. I do I do feel like video games, um, movies, the media in general, <laughs> the creators of it. Are being influenced by spiritual forces. I mean, one the, all the different lessons that are given, the way that the things are presented in different games and movies, sometimes is just off the charts. I'm like, how did they? How did they pluck this out yeah. of the actual plane? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd have to agree. I've seen uh, things through the media and whatnot. It's like that's a little too close to on point. Yeah, especially especially uh, my you know my daughter was watching some uh, some different shows. Danny Phantom was one about this kid that can pop in and out of the astral plane. And at one point, he's um, he's got some spirits that are after him. And this is just a cartoon that she's watching as a kid. He's got some spirits after him. So he runs and he grabs some uh, some hot peppers, some red peppers, and starts putting them in a circle around him. And I'm all, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're giving away <laughs> secrets here. This, this, stuff, this stuff used to be you know, taught by initiation only. Now it's on cartoons. I love it. <laughs> Um, well, I guess you can squeeze it. through because technically hoodoo wasn't by initiation like voodoo, but you know a lot of the hoodoo root workers around the Appalachians they know the hot pepper trick. So mm -hmm. at least you squeak through on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Sidestep over here. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. you see a lot of accuracy in these medias, which is I, I think is great. Mm -hmm. Um, it's super cool you're doing a book on necromancy. I'd love to do another show with you guys talking about necromancy, though. It'd be super cool. Oh, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah, I love working with necromancy. Actually, I'm tickled to death. There's a graveyard I've spent a lot of time working with. It's not a, not a quarter mile straight up here. Mm. Um, when the military station does, they're like, we'll put you right by the graveyard, you look. <laughs> so... Um, uh, that tickled me to death. So I actually may have to check out your book there, EA, on that necromancy. Yeah. I know a lot of people want me to do a class on it, and it's like, do you know how many classes you guys have backlogged? You want me to fill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a you know. Well, here, here's the big uh, obstacle I ran into with uh, necromancy, with teaching necromancy. There's just so much of it that you, that, that you can't put words to that it's like, okay, now you lose lose yourself in the realm of death and let go of everything. After that, there's not much more you can say. Um, and so so it is that, that you know, I've, I've been able to find some really interesting ways of connecting people with different graveyard rites and stuff like that. But a good deal of it is is honestly sacrificing yourself as fully as you can at the altar and and, and just letting yourself go. You've, you've probably already done this, but in case you haven't, I'll just pitch it out there for you to consider. Talk to Odin and Hell, because first off, Odin understands the sacrifice of self. And Hell, as, well, probably one of the better caretakers, and I mean, she has a bad rap, she really does. Um, when it comes to that letting go and living it, she's one that can really communicate that. Um, you probably already spoke to both of them, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I have. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. So working with hell, she is bleak. Like there are some, there are a lot of uh, entities, especially goddesses, that I walk away with a really warm feeling. I almost walk away with like a nihilistic sadness every time I come away from hell. See, that's interesting. Um, she actually, to me, I mean, I won't ever say she's been really chipper, so I get the nihilistic concept, but... There is a comfort that I get from her that I don't get from any other entity. It's just like this comforting security, this assuredness. I don't know. Mm. It, it's weird. Mm. Always enjoy yeah. working with her. No, you know, because so the feeling I've gotten from her is interesting because the, the comfort that she's offered me is not that everything's going to be all right. It's like, don't worry, it's all going to be fucked. <laughs> Okay, I get that. I do get that. I do get that. I understand that because she is very much one to look at the big picture, to look that, you know, she kind of is the embodiment of the only thing you can't escape is death and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
I, I get what you're saying there. And I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I've always adored her working with her. Mm. I, I get what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah. But that really is the essence of, uh, for me, of my, my daily death meditation is to really approach it and, 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 and you know, I've got a whole altar set up that I'll, I'll kneel in front of and, 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 and approach it as um, not just death, but there are a lot of things that are completely out of our control that we just have to let go of. The, the, the big lesson that death has always told me is the only, the only thing that you can control is whether or not you want to accept this. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, that's actually a lesson I learned from uh, Mark Tomaras, the ruler of the Dragon of the Darkness, laid that one out for me clearly. Mm. You can't control every aspect of the multiverse. Some things are completely out of your control. They're just going to happen. What you can control is how you choose to react. Mm. And it, the closest thing to control you have is choosing your reaction. Because she made it very clear that, you know, if you just react emotionally out of instinct, the you're not choosing that reaction. You're just, you're letting the situation control you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I, I am compelled, I have been actually through, through this whole conversation, compelled to tell you about kind of my first experience, I think, with consciously recognizing dragons. You know, I've had, I've had people like you, like you, I've had people... Tell me, you know, you've, you've got dragons around you. You've got the, the 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 blessing of the dragon, and I'm like, that sounds like sounds woo woo to me. That sounds a little bit like fairies. Although they got any <laughs> blessing or not, but <laughs> yeah. So so I uh, uh, I kind of dismissed it, but one day I was uh, I was meditating with just a, a candle burning, and I'm gazing at the candle, just doing regular just. Trataka candle gazing meditation. I've been doing it since I was like 16 years old, almost on a daily basis. Never had this experience before. The, uh, the candle flame and the aura around it completely mutates until it's a dragon's eye just staring at me. And, I, uh, and so I speak to it. I'm like, oh, well, thank you for showing up here. Is there something I need to know from you? And it said, just a voice that emanated from the eye said, Aren't you supposed to be meditating? <laughs> okay. wow. Oh my and god, had, that sounds like them. Like they will show up, they'll be, you know, it's like I'm gonna observe, and then you notice them and they're like, Weren't you doing something? Don't pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Like and even the gonna... older ones have this kind of childish whimsy about them. Mm. And it just it's so off-putting sometimes because it's like, weren't you doing something? <laughs> but ever ever since that moment, I've seen that same eye. Sometimes it'll appear with the clouds around the sun. Sometimes it'll just be a reflection in, the, in, 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 a, in something as I pass. But it's like, and it's not all the time. It's not every time I see a round object that turns into an eye. But just now and again, it's almost like a little signal of, hey, we're watching you and, and, and you're watching us back. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That yeah. And it, and it doesn't feel like, like, here's, here's the, the black magician in me was like, how can I harness this? And it was like, don't, no, just... Just sit with it. Just appreciate it, you know? Yeah. 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 That actually, I think, for some people, is the hardest part of dragon magic is because we shift to that harnessing and working with where dragons, the biggest thing they want, they don't want to be worshipped. They don't want offerings. They want friendship. Mm. They want that genuine friendship. And that sounds so simple, but when you the way most magicians approach other entities, that's a really hard gear to shift into sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. Well, I guess I got, I got to wrap up here in just a minute and, and head off and I'm taking the kids to the county fair tonight. So I got to go get ready for that. Awesome. But Definitely. Have some fun before I, I got to jump off. All right. All right, guys. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I can, I'll shoot you a message um, here. Yeah. Or um, no, I'll give you. I'll, I'll send you my uh, my email. I'll get you. I'll get you some links. I'd love to. I'd love to to chat with you more about uh, hopefully hopefully bringing some of your products over and, and making them blow up. All right, um, I'd All be right. interested in it. All right, yeah. awesome. thanks. Have guys. a good night, man. Good talking to you. Have fun with the Wonderful kids. Wonderful to talk to you. Yeah. So...
you know, we can still keep this interview a little bit for a while. I so, mean, if you have any other questions, I'll, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, so we covered a lot in this interview. This was really the best interview we ever filmed. And Aww. I really had a great honor of like... I like blush, I'm bald. I don't want to look like an apple. One thing, <laughs> there is one thing I would like to ask, which is, okay, so essentially where I am from, how you approach dragons is you have to work with the Fae first. It's like elementary school. And then you are supposed to approach dragons by lighting a big fire and then throwing shit into the fire and calling dragon above the fire. So the dragon appears and manifests as a flame itself. And then you essentially work with the dragon. So my question is how somebody can start working with dragons. Like if you have something you can share. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um ironically it's the bonfire concept that is a ritual i've done when i go camping it's not a requirement but i'm actually hoping to film that because i'm in a great area for camping now um but for anyone who's interested in trying to get in touch with the dragons um as just a basic at least as they've laid out for me specifically um on our channel we have what the dragons refer to as the dragon's flame ritual which when i look at how this ritual works it's almost a ritual construction of what you just described because you call out to the first four rulers and you visualize them breathing the fire down to the working area so they're creating the flames in that bonfire concept now you're not evoking them let's be clear you're not evoking them you're just calling to them so it's only like a shadow of their power coming down um, and you can sit there and meditate, and that will draw a lot of the dragons in your vicinity to you, um, or even bring your awareness to them if you're not aware of them already being there, whether they're small, little, whatnot. That would be one of the first things you can do to start getting plugged into that current. Um, from there, if you wanted to meet your guardian dragon, because most people want to think of guardian dragon like guardian angel, like you're born with this dragon. Whereas it's actually a job assignment. So like the younger dragons actually have a point where they have to work with us humans to understand us. And that ritual is on the channel. So you can actually find that, I must say it's a guided meditation. Um, it's been a while since I made the video. And that can get you in touch with your guardian dragon and start working with it directly um, in spell work and rituals and stuff like that. Okay. Both are great ways to get started. Um, and if you're interested in a deep dive, um, if you don't mind, um, you can go to workingdragonmystic.com, click on the online courses, Dragon Magic 101 is right over there. It is a full path working. It has, you'll meet your guardian, your co. Um, there's a path working with each of the first four rulers. Um, it's... If you're really wanting, if you know Dragon Magic, something you really want to invest in, that would be the best way to go. Yeah, so essentially, I have uh, one more question for you, which is, I am interested in, so I had an experience with the dragons, like my first initial experience, and then I worked with the same dark primordial dragon for a long time. I am interested are those i i will explain how that dragon looks like essentially okay. and then i would ask you to uh, to tell me did you ever encounter something similar or whatever okay so that dragon doesn't look like an entity at all it looks like an infinity absolute infinity projecting itself in a little portion of draconian form but when you guide me to his like reality or to what he is, uh, it it's, it doesn't look like guiding. It looks more like somebody forcefully pushing you to where he is, like pulling you out of the body. It looks like dark infinity, absolute dark infinity, speaking to you in a voice. It doesn't look like an entity at all. But when um, you summon a ritual space, it has a form of a dragon, 
like a little form of a dragon, but it's just an interface you're interacting with. Hmm. I have seen dragons that do occasionally, um, like when you go to them, they would have that format. Um, and that's usually based on where the dragons are located um, when you go to them. Um, the surprising thing is when you bring them into the ritual space, it takes on that small size. That's that's kind of the, um, that's what's throwing me off here, because I was about to say it sounds a lot like a Chaos Dragon or one of these higher um, elemental dragons. But the thing is, like, the ruler of the Chaos Dragons, for example, you're not going to fit him in a ritual space. He would actually, he his draconic form wouldn't fit on our planet. And there's this weird thing, like, they can only shape change to a certain extent. So, like, him sizing down isn't an option to him because of his age. But he could take on a humanoid form. That's why dragons actually use their humanoid forms, is to fit in smaller areas. So, this does sound like an interesting dragon. And I have seen dragons do this. And... Just because it's small does not mean it's not powerful. Again, we had that discussion earlier. But that would somewhat suggest that it's um, the type of dragon it is usually wouldn't grow large or it's slightly on the younger end. Now, if it's on that younger end, it could be a dragon that, um, like, let's say you were to do the ritual to get a dragon assigned to you as your guardian. I wouldn't be surprised if it was that thing. And the reason, like, the infinite expanse you described, um, that usually, you see this in dragons in the void. Because the void is a nothing and everything all at once. It's like infinite and nothing, you know. It's all that happened at one time. So you do see that in the void. Um, so I would be inclined to lead to its but it could very potentially be a dragon who's interested in you, is already working with you, helping you. Um, it could have an interest in your culture. Believe it or not, dragons actually adore human culture, and some of them specialize in our studies. Um, I've actually ran into American dragons, and I'm not even going to tell you how funny I found that. <laughs> but um, so it could be any of those things, and without specifically talking to the rulers or trying to reach out to it, it would be hard for me to pinpoint and nail down for sure. Okay, but you kind of gave me a lot of guidelines and I kind of know who or what it is by your experience. I, I just wanted to compare our experiences and it's yeah. pretty much... I would say you're honest. Us, it's a pretty much despite of the fact that we never talk to each other. Experience yeah. is more or less the same. Like it's 99.9% .9 overlap. And yeah, it's it always struck yeah. me how similar it is. Uh, so I am really glad that we had this amazing opportunity to talk. So, Danny, do you have any questions to close the interview? Um, no. Um, this was a really great discussion. Uh, wonderful. I'm so glad that we got to have you on, Jake. Oh, I had a blast. I'm honored to be on here. Thank you guys for inviting me. And um, if y'all want to do it again sometime, just let me know. Yeah, yeah. We will you know, talk to you, Drake. I'm really glad we had you and we will speak okay. another time. All right. Um, and I'll make sure to, once this is posted, I'll 